without further ado, you're here to see Pen Testing a CD from Greg Conti, Tom Cross, and Dave Raymond. So please give them a warm round of applause. Thank you. And we'd like to thank uh, Sim City Godzilla as well for his help. Hi, I'm Greg Conti. This is Dave Raymond and Tom Cross. Thank you for joining us at uh, Pen Testing a City. Uh, before we get started, we're here as uh, free citizens. We don't represent anyone, any employers. Uh, we're also not lawyers. And please, if you're going to pen test anything, especially a city, please talk to your lawyer first. So, Tom? Uh, hey, I'm Tom Cross. I'm the CTO of Drawbridge Networks. Um, uh, previously worked at Landcope and uh, IBM X-Force Research. Um, done a lot of vulnerability research over the years. Uh, my name is David Raymond. I was uh, <clears throat> most recently um, faculty at West Point where I did cybersecurity education research and uh, just transitioned now. I'm doing the same thing at uh, Virginia Tech. And I'm Greg Conti. I'm currently at West Point where I'm a, a faculty member and security researcher and I'll be transitioning from the Army next summer. Okay, so cities, why are they important? Well, what really motivated us in, in this, uh, to give this talk, to conduct this research, was that we're good at penetration testing and analyzing security properties of, of individual products and businesses of varying degrees of scale. But when you think about what keeps countries, nations secure, and what really where civilization you know, thrives, it, it's based on cities. And you know, there's a big delta between securing a company and securing a city. And we want to take a look at that. And as part of that, we've had some really unique access uh, inside the, the workings of several major cities uh, and talking to some of their security professionals about their challenges. So that helped inform with real world, I think, real world insights into, into the research we were doing. Yeah, and when you think about cities, they're, uh, they're, they're microcosms uh, of nations, uh, really, to uh, explore best practices. So if we can start figuring out how to scale from uh, the, you know, the techniques and strategies that, and that will allow us to, from, to go from a pen testing in a company, a large company, to pen testing a city, then we can start thinking about uh, how to secure nations. That, that was the idea, and if we can figure out th that those insights, then maybe perhaps they'll generalize, not just in the United States, but we can, we can figure out how then to pass this around to other cities and share the results. Well, you think about the thin veneer of civilization, right? It doesn't take much for to tip over civilization, and it's hard enough to keep things working uh, without there being an adversary. You think of two inches of snow and a bad weather call or two down in Atlanta paralyzed the city. You can think the New York City uh, blackout that caused rioting, the uh, what you know, the earthquakes, and, and it goes on and on. Um, so, Dave, you had an example uh, for Baltimore. <clears throat> so, one thing we'll be talking about is is the potential for cascading failures when a failure in one infrastructure causes uh, um, cascading failures in other infrastructures. One good example is from uh, 2001 when a um, commuter train um, derailed in a train tunnel in Baltimore. And uh, of course it caused the expected delays in commuter train traffic and in automobile traffic in the surrounding area. What also happened during that derailment was a water main uh, was broken and it caused localized flooding which flooded power substations and caused um, power to go out for most of the city for, for about a day. Um, also uh, um, what happened was there was a small fire associated with the uh, derailment and it uh, severed uh, fiber optic cables that really controlled uh, communication between some uh, major companies on the eastern seaboard, so it caused disruption in network communications uh, all the way from New York City down into Washington, D.C. So, so here's an example of a, of a fairly localized event that can cause um, cascading failures uh, really throughout the infrastructure sectors. And as another example, we, you know, we we're thinking about you know, scenarios like that are happening by accident. Well, we've, we've had throughout the last uh, few years, or really many years, the InfoSec community's done some great research and pr uh, provided point cases on vulnerabilities in cities. Uh, and, and one of my favorite stories, I don't know if you call, I, I call him a hacker, not a, a vulnerability researcher presenting at a conference, but um, a, a teenager uh, in, in 2008 
d developed, um, basically hacked the tram system in, using a, a modified television remote control and derailed uh, a train in his, uh, in his hometown in Poland. Uh, just uh, just as a hobby project, and that was a teenager. So we'll talk a little bit more about what the implications of like the ind individual, relatively small scale research that people are doing, and that what could be built upon that because it's it's hard enough to keep cities running. Tom, I mean, as you all know, uh, Chris Valsek and Charlie Miller um, successfully did a remote, con uh, uh, you know, a full control of an automobile, and there are 1.4 million uh, automobiles I think that were vulnerable to that attack, and that's certainly not the only vulnerability like that. And so if you can cause you know, that sort of cascading failure with a derailed train, you know, imagine what you could do with a well-placed sport utility vehicle. Um, a lot of the scenarios that for years we've sort of dismissed as maybe science fiction scenarios or um, risks that were sort of overblown, um, we're now getting into a point in time where those things are becoming more and more realistic. So uh, one good place for us to start is to just think about what we mean by the term city. And it um, uh, turns out, um, even though we all have sort of an intuitive understanding of what a city is, it's fairly difficult to... Uh, to, to define, and uh, so we Googled it and got this um, decidedly poor uh, definition, particularly the second uh, the informal version of the definition. Um, <clears throat> a little more digging led to some, to some pretty good attributes, uh, things that you could use to describe a city, and, and really, you know, a city is, as we think of it as a, as a large town, uh, you know, municipal area, it could also be a, a, a tribal area, um, you know, there are sort of a, a different versions of what a city might be, but um, for our purposes, um, a city uh, has to, you know, f for it to be a, um, something that, that we're concerned about, it has um, large-scale network infrastructure composed of probably critical infrastructure, non-critical infrastructure, maybe many businesses, uh, and then some sort of a, a municipal uh, network architecture. Um, <clears throat> and uh, even with that, you know, fairly clear definition, um, you know, there's a, there's a broad uh, uh, there are broad differences between cities. If you just look at population alone, cities might range from a few thousand people to tens of millions of people. Um, so if you look at this uh, chart, it just shows uh, populations of some large municipalities around the world. Uh, Tokyo with, with almost 40 million people. Um, the largest city in the United States, New York City, has, has uh, only half that, and, and numbers obviously can go, uh, can go uh, down from there. So there, there are different ways, and we're going to talk about how there are different ways of defining a city. Often cities are defined based on a particular county or administrative region. Um, uh, we also tend to think about metropolitan areas. When you think of New York City, you think of the whole place and not just, you know, it's not just the five boroughs necessarily. Um, and so uh, the United States being what it is, the best way to decide uh, how big a city is in this country is to look at the television viewing audience. Uh, and that's what marketing professionals do. Um, and they, they have these uh, metro area DMA codes. Um, that represent the television viewing uh, population for a particular uh, metro area. Um, and actually, these DMA codes are used often in online marketing, and they're used um, in the GeoCities database to integrate the metro area that a particular IP block is in. Uh, so I took a look at uh, uh, how many IP addresses were assigned to the 10 largest um, uh, DMA metro areas in the United States. Um, and what's interesting is that the geography of cyberspace is often different than that of the real world. I don't know why Houston has so many IP IPv4 addresses. Uh, if any of you do, please talk to me after the talk. Um, and of course, uh, you can see that IPv6 deployment is uh, radically different um, uh, at different stages in different in different metro areas. So, uh, good, good. and you, you see various trends. And one of the trends right now is cities, uh, particularly those that characterize themselves as smart cities or, or aspire to be smart cities, uh, employing uh, networks of sensors to help them uh, gather data, analyze the data, and, pr and uh, provide better services uh, for their people. Maybe, and also, for example, provide more energy efficiency. Uh, with that comes, though, I think, as everyone in the room would recognize, that when you bring on uh, additional technologies, uh, that really uh, increases the attack surface. And you can see as well that industry is aware of the opportunity in smart cities and and just cities of all types. I mean, I, I tend to think of cities as there's dumb cities, there's moderately intelligent cities, and there's smart cities. There's a whole spectrum there. But so there, industry has recognized this, and here are just three examples uh, of uh, groups that are looking to provide products and services. Uh, here example, uh, Cisco Smart Connected uh, Communities, IBM's Intelligent Operations Center, and recently Google's Sidewalk Labs. So it's drawing the attention uh, of industry as well. 
and uh, I already mentioned dumb cities, uh, but uh, I wonder, I, it, it would now be a good time for a question. Who ha still has a Honeywell 1950s era thermostat on their wall? Good choice. Okay, so good choice because you're probably a lot safer. Uh, does your home, is your home decorated like that? <laughs> uh, okay. Okay, now moving on to like what it really means to, to try and think about pen testing of something the scale that we're talking about. Well, we began our analysis looking at, uh, and this is, uh, for those of you familiar with SANS, this is SANS 560, they have a, uh, their penetration testing uh, methodology. And, and it works, you know, in a, in a certain scoped environment, it works, right? But how does something like this scale up, or where do you begin when you're thinking at city scale? And another uh, piece is, you know, it's not just network penetration tests. We have basic building blocks of, of traditional pen testing. You think a network penetration test, physical penetration test, a web application penetration test, or a human slash software engineer. So those are the basic, basic building blocks that you uh, might have to work with. Again, how do you prioritize? How do you focus those efforts? So um, we, we decided to, to start with the SANS um, framework and build upon a, a, a framework that looks at um, some of the intersections uh, th that uh, Dave was talking about earlier in his Baltimore example. So, um, you know, tr traditional SANS process starts with, you know, understanding the scope of the pen test and then auditing the technical surface area and then doing a risk analysis and a report for the client. Um, in our case, we start with the same place. We, we define the scope, like what is a city? We talked about the way, the fact that there are different ways of defining that scope. Um, and then we audit the attack surface. Cities have unique attack surfaces that don't exist within organizations, so we're going to take you through that layer by layer. Um, and then once we've identified the point vulnerabilities in that attack surface, we really need to start looking at what the intersections are between the, those point vulnerabilities that can cause the sort of cascading failures that Dave was referring to. Um, and we look specifically for pressure points that you can push on that can cause those dominoes to start falling. Um, and then on top of that, you can then build your risk analysis. You can assess um, what threat actors are interested in pushing those buttons. And that gives you a more sort of comprehensive understanding of what the risks are to a, uh, to a complex system like a city. Um, so, you know, the first step here is that we're going to dissect the, the surface area of the city and, and talk about those different surface areas. And then we'll go through the cross-sectioning pressure point and risk analysis. So and, and we have to understand that cities themselves, it's not just the local, it's, it's just not the local government. The local government is ri uh, riding herd over a loose coalition of the willing and unwilling uh, to, uh, to try and make the city function. Uh, here's an example from San Francisco. So you have the, the local government, but they've got 200,000 commercial entities, thousands of nonprofits, and a population of uh, 837,000 plus or minus. So that, I mean, that's the complexity that you're looking at, and, it, and it's an important aspect is it's not, just not the, the government itself. You have to think about all the interdependencies, all the interconnections between these disparate groups. And then just a quick look at what, if you want to think about uh, protecting a nation, in the United States, using statistics uh, that from there, uh, there's 39,000 cities. Uh, 1.5 million nonprofits, 27 million small businesses, and uh, then you get into hundreds of millions of smartphones, personal computers, and people, and potentially billions with the emerging Internet of Things. So really, it just goes up. It's like powers that, that video, powers of 10. It just gets harder and harder and harder and more complex. So we have to manage that complexity. So uh, one way to look at surface area for something like a city is to analyze it in terms of the cyberspace planes. And this is a framework that we've used to analyze different cyber infrastructure in, in some of our uh, recent research over the last couple of years. So with, with the planes at the very top, you have the supervisory plane, which includes uh, people and processes that might provide command and control over uh, other uh, lower elements of cyberspace. You have the persona plane, which is... Um, you know, think uh, uh, um, network personas, uh, login, uh, login names, uh, email addresses, uh, even, even uh, social media uh, presences. Uh, below that, you have the logical plane. So you have layers two through seven of the OSI model, op uh, operating system and application software, uh, um, device drivers, uh, uh, network, uh, um, different network protocols and packets. 
Below that is the physical plane, so layer one devices, routers, switches, uh, cables, et cetera. And then uh, the geographic plane really describes the, the physical location of some of those network devices, which is often uh, uh, relevant. So something that's different about cities uh, than, than with other uh, uh, network infrastructures is you have this very heavy influence of, of politics really at all the planes. Um, particularly though, we, we see politics at play at the supervisory plane. So you, you're, you're likely to have, uh, you know, a city is gonna be influenced by uh, state and federal governments uh, applying pressure at various points uh, in the supervisory plane. Um, <clears throat> there are various forms of municipal government uh, so each city is, is uh, you know, sort of uh, organized in its own way. Um, here we have a, a sample uh, organi organizational uh, diagram for a city. And you have this combination of elected officials and appointed officials, and, and that's going to cause tensions between uh, uh, different factions within the city government. Here this picture shows um, a city manager, uh, ca a council manager style of, of um, municipal government. And in this picture, the, the, uh, the police chief you know, reports through the city manager to the city council. You can imagine, though, in a city that has a particularly strong police force, for example, that uh, the police chief really may sort of own his own little fiefdom and, and doesn't feel like he reports to anybody, even though the organizational chart, you know, shows him beholden to the city manager. <clears throat> so again, elected officials uh, um, and appointed officials, the, the appointed officials are, are obviously beholden to the to the elected officials who put them in place, and then you have elected officials who are um, concerned about pleasing the constituency, uh, so they continue to be elected officials. And then you can imagine these silos of, of excellence, right? So you have all these different infrastructure sectors and uh, various government uh, agencies and uh, um, uh, private entities. They all have their own network, uh, um, little silos, uh, some, some of which are, are better secured than, than others. And um, this, this uh, diagram is just sort of designed to evoke um, what those silos look like from the top down. And you have all these very, very... Um, uh, uh, complex interdependencies between all the silos. So even if some of them are very well secured, you can imagine that others are less well secured, and then you have sort of this weakest link problem. If you take a step down a level to the persona plane, uh, you know, cities and, and other small governments tend toward openness, right? So they want uh, um, the people to have access to the politicians. They publish a lot of information online. They have a very uh, active social media presence. They're, they're publishing uh, email addresses and information about uh, members of the city government. And all this could be a very rich source of information for a social engineering campaign. At the logical plane, uh, again, you have interdependencies with, with uh, systems that um, aren't necessarily very compatible. You're likely to have industrial control systems throughout the city uh, IT infrastructure, more and more of which are uh, connected to the internet, both for cost savings and, and for the, the purpose of convenience. And uh, a lot of those uh, industrial control systems are notoriously insecure. You also have uh, city management software. So you have software that's specifically designed to, to, for, for uh, cities to purchase and use to manage city operations. Um, that's a, a software that has a very, fairly small user base purchased by uh, organizations that probably don't have big budgets. And uh, it would be interesting, I think, to do, to do a, a vulnerability assessment of some of this city management software. Uh, one example is the IBM Intelligent Operations Center. So here, here you have uh, um, this tool that can be used to view city conditions, uh, used to analyze citizens' social media sentiments. Really, it, it, it's sort of like a, a real-world, you know, Sim City playing out uh, in real time right in front of you. So uh, a typical part of a, of a pen test at the logical plane is to do a port scan. Uh, and so we figured we'd take a look at what services uh, some of the major cities in the United States are running. Uh, most of the major cities in the United States, it turns out, have provider independent IP address spaces. Uh, and so it's pretty easy to uh, find out what the range of IPs um, that the city government is using and uh, take a look at, at uh, what's in those IP address spaces. Um, Sometimes uh, city governments will have a website that's just running within that IP range. Um, in other cases, um, you know, consistently we found that, uh, you know, there'll be some sort of, if they're, if they're using Akamai or some sort of hosting service for their website, that they'll have like a web app uh, behind that website that's doing something like letting people pay traffic tickets or some other bureaucratic uh, uh, city process. And the web app will be hosted on a machine that's in the, in the provider independent space. Uh, so once you've got one IP in the space, you can go to the Aaron database and get 
get the uh, whole IP block um, and uh, you know see the entire uh, IP address range for for a given city. Oh, I have the clicker now. <laughs> so um, uh, this is a chart that shows you um, the TCP/IP services that are hosted on the internet by the ten largest uh, uh, by the city governments of the ten largest metro areas in the United States. Um, and uh, uh, this data came from the Shodan database. Um, we, uh, you know, so of course there's uh, banner information and other things uh, along with that data. Uh, and there's some pretty interesting stuff when you uh, when you drill into the details. Um, you know, at the low end, of course, we expect to see lots of web servers. Um, one of these cities has an IBM mainframe that's serving as an FTP server on the open internet. Um, there's lots of um, off-brand SSH demons, um, and there are a number of legacy web servers. Um, a few instances of IIS version 6, which either runs on Windows XP or Windows 2003, which is still supported as a server OS, I think. Uh, and then, um, uh, you know, I found a number of um, Netscape Enterprise Server version 6.0, which was released in 2001. Um, uh, moving up the chain, um, you know, we, we expect to see uh, VPN endpoints. That's, um, you know, something we would anticipate finding. Um, but there are other things we were surprised to see, uh, like a printer, um, a directory server, uh, a number of databases, um, uh, some Windows PowerShell ports. Um, uh, in the case of Washington, D.C., uh, there were a number of services over port 10,000 that we decided not to include in this chart because it just made the chart too much of an eye chart. Um, but uh, uh, those ports included some ports associated with a video conferencing system. Um, so, uh, um, you know, drilling down from the logical plane to the physical plane, um, cities have a really interesting physical plane, particularly from a wireless perspective. Um, the, uh, uh, the cities have traditionally used wireless um, to communicate with uh, and to coordinate operations across a large uh, physical area. They've got, you know, uh, police and other emergency services. They've got uh, maintenance people, garbage trucks, et cetera. All these people communicate over wireless networks. Um, a lot of this stuff is becoming computerized. Uh, there are wireless emergency coordination and broadcast systems. Um, and then these smart cities initiatives are bringing a whole bunch of new technology um, online. Um, often it's either in the 2.5 gigahertz or 5.4 gigahertz um, uh, bands. Um, and uh, a lot of this stuff is, is getting deployed, um, you know, without encryption or with encryption that is very poorly architected. Um, and so, uh, um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a really interesting wireless spectrum uh, analysis uh, problem associated with pen testing a city. Um, at the same time, we're kind of seeing this renaissance in terms of tools that are available to uh, people in our community uh, 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 that enable us to audit the wireless spectrum. Um, you know, I went out and spent 20 bucks uh, and got this little USB key that enables me to do spectrum analysis up to 1.6 gigahertz using an app on my Android phone. Um, so that's really awesome. Um, and in fact, there's there's a whole lot of people playing with this at DEF CON in the, in the wireless village. Um, uh, so, you know, there's sort of this renaissance happening where on the one hand, we're seeing all this smart city infrastructure get deployed with all these wireless protocols that are interesting. Um, and we as a community are getting a bunch of new tools that enable us to investigate and research and hack that stuff. So, um, uh, you know, I think there's going to be lots of interesting developments over time in this area. Um, Below the physical plane, we have the geographic plane. The geographic plane is relevant in the context of cities for two reasons. The first is that um, you, you may not, you may have to deploy something in a particular location because that's where the city is. It's not your fault that um, hundreds of years ago people decided to settle in a tsunami subduction zone. That happens to be where you are, and you're going to have your computers there, even though um, you would rather put them up in the hills where they're safer. Uh, so that's a that's a challenge that cities have to contend with. Um, the second issue is that you, when you think about testing a corporation, usually they have like property that you can't trespass on and all of their infrastructure is inside that property. So from the outside, you have some physical access challenges, but we live inside of cities and we have to be allowed into them. And the infrastructure is kind of built up around us in a city. Um, and that means that we can get physical access to it in ways that, that sometimes we can't um, when we're looking at a, uh, um, a, you know, sort of a corporate infrastructure. And so that's relevant and it leads to um, a threat models and attacks that, that don't necessarily exist for, for most organizations. Um, 
So with respect to the sort of point vulnerabilities that exist in these systems, there's been a ton of research that's been presented on this stage um, and at DEF CON over the years and at other hacker cons um, uh, that, that demonstrate point vulnerabilities in systems that are popular in cities. Um, uh, you know, a couple of prominent examples, uh, Cesar Carudo's um, excellent research last year uh, on um, uh, hacking uh, traffic lights. So there are these traffic lights that um, communicate with uh, vehicle sensors over a wireless protocol that has no encryption and so you can spoof the messages and turn the lights on and off. He's also uh, looked at start smart street lamps. Um, there, uh, there have been uh, there was a talk on um, uh, uh, you know bad in, uh, wireless encryption uh, for uh, 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 municipal surveillance systems so that you can get access to cameras or uh, you know turn on the, the these things have uh, speakers that allow you to uh, talk to people. <laughs> so you can you can talk to people who are around the cameras. Uh, the um, there was a really good talk uh, at Black Hat Europe a couple years ago where these guys got a smart meter off their house um, and uh, um, it used a wireless mesh network to communicate and it was uh, the, the encryption was done with a fixed AES key that was stored in the EEPROM and so they were able to get the the you know dump the EEPROM and get the AES key out and using that key they could send messages to everyone's house turning the power off. Uh, so there's there's tons of vulnerabilities that have been uh, have been uh, uh, you know discussed at these conferences over the years that uh, um, you're going to find when you audit real cities and increasingly as as some of this new technology gets deployed. Um, so once you've once you've looked at the surface area and you understand the point vulnerabilities, uh, we got to get to the next step, which um, you know is I think unique to these really complicated infrastructures where we need to consider the intersections between all of those vulnerable components and try to figure out where uh, uh, you know we could have a problem with uh, with a domino effect. And so the cross sectioning is all about identifying uh, interdependencies between all these various networks and systems. And so you can imagine that if, if uh, um, someone's, someone were to uh, try to uh, take malicious actions against the city's network, there, there's some effects that they're going to achieve. And then those effects have uh, uh, second and third order effects that, that cascade from there and, and not only cascade directly down a single path, but sort of could, could cascade uh, exponentially out on, on several different paths. Fortunately, there is a there is a fairly uh, um, strong body of work on interdependency modeling, at least for critical infrastructure sectors. So um, here's an example of of um, some of that work, and this image shows uh, uh, an analysis of interdependency uh, interdependencies between a handful of infrastructure sectors. So here you have uh, uh, individual planes that represent uh, infrastructure sectors. Then parallel lines represent subsets of the infrastructure. Nodes represent key components. And then the dotted lines show some of the interdependencies. And so, for example, in this image, you, ha you, could ha you might have a, an electrical substation uh, failure on the energy plane that causes a sewer pumping station to fail on the water plane that then leads to city roads being flooded and, and being disrupted on the transportation plane. So with this sort of more broad understanding of what the different interdependencies are, then, then you can start to think about prioritizing uh, where you want to uh, um, uh, put your cybersecurity effort. This uh, it just shows another way to, to sort of uh, graphically think through um, those uh, different interdependencies. And now once we've analyzed the interdependencies, we can, we can take a look at the cascading consequences, right? So we can think of individual events that might have cascading consequences uh, um, you know, down a variety of different paths. And if you can draw, uh, you, know, you, know, you can draw some conclusions based on this sort of analysis to, to again, think about the prioritization. Um, so again, f a fairly robust body of research. Again, it's, it's sort of focused on the, uh, on the critical infrastructure sectors and um, uh, really mostly done for disaster planning sorts of scenarios, but uh, here's some references to some work that, that's been done and, and these slides will be available eventually, I'm sure, uh, on the Black Hat website. So <clears throat> now that we've uh, put some thought into uh, the way th these uh, um, different individual silos are interconnected, now we can start to think about some of those pressure points, so places where you might be able to push, uh, you know, on, on something that causes uh, um, these ripple effects throughout a city's infrastructure. And the way we like to think about that um, is using this thing that we call a center of gravity analysis, and this draws from military doctrine. Uh, um, so so the, the center of gravity is the source of strength for, for, an, for an entity or for an organization. And if you think of cities, you know, cities have their individual centers of strength, right? So if you think of New York City, you have the financial sector. That is, that is a, a, a source of strength for the city. Uh, in Orlando, you have the amusement park uh, business. Um, God forbid if, if Denver were to lose the uh, um, legalized marijuana industry. 
and then, uh, of course, here in Las Vegas, you know, we have, we have the gambling industry as, as a center of strength. So uh, various uh, centers of gravity, industry-related uh, centers of gravity um, um, in different cities. And then you have the critical infrastructure sectors, right? So this is the list of 16 critical infrastructure sectors from, from uh, DHS. And, you know, all cities have some of these. Some cities have all of these. Uh, and um, there are certain things you could cause to happen in different infrastructure sectors that could cause uh, some, some uh, serious cascading effects. And then we should also think about the non-critical infrastructure, right? So you have churches, you have sports facilities, uh, um, you know, theaters, local banks, law offices, things that uh, could have a, a, a large impact if they were to be adversely affected uh, in a metropolitan area. And this isn't just hyperbole. So there are recent relevant examples of city centers of gravity being attacked uh, from, from a cyber, uh, you know, being uh, targeted by uh, cyber actors. And uh, here are just a list of a few. So you have the Sony hack, you have the Sands Casino hack uh, last year, Saudi Aramco, uh, NASDAQ in, in 2010. And uh, so, you know, each one of these were fairly small-scale attacks. But you can imagine if there were, if there were not only a large-scale attack on a city center of gravity, but a large-scale attack uh, uh, um, coupled with some attacks in, in some critical infrastructure sectors, you can imagine these cascading failures sort of causing ripples uh, throughout the whole place. So once we once we have identified these pressure points and and uh, we we understand uh, you know where the centers of gravity are, we need to perform a risk analysis. Um, and the the basis of this risk analysis is not dissimilar from what we need to do in a regular technical pen test of a private company. Um, we need to look at the different threat actors that these organizations face, um, and we need to consider you know what motivations those threat actors have, um, what capabilities those threat actors have. Do they have the ability to exploit a particular vulnerability? Um, I also think it's important to think about um, the typical MO of that group um, and, and how they usually operate um, because they're likely to do things in the future that they have done in the past. Um, things that are huge pivots for them are less likely to occur even if they're within their capabilities. Um, and also what the, what the life cycle um, of their attack, um, uh, 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 what, what, what the frequency of their attacks are. Um, and that enables us to predict um, how likely a particular event is to happen in the future. Um, there are a few conclusions that this sort of general conclusions that this sort of risk analysis process um, uh, implies for cities. The first is that um, you can be a small city that's kind of out in the middle of nowhere um, and, you know, kind of f think of yourself as off the beaten path and still be a target um, internationally for, um, you know, computer attacks uh, because on the Internet everything is, is just as connected. And so you're as, just as accessible as Los Angeles um, from, from, a, from a, a computer perspective. Uh, and so that's something that, um, you know, sometimes catches people off guard. Um, another fact is that... that um, um, we, we can um, so so uh, we we can have infrastructure that's vulnerable that sits out there for a long period of time that without necessarily having anything bad happen. Um, I tend to think about the way that you know people tend to settle in earthquake prone regions or regions that are subject to tsunamis and they can live there for years and years and years before um, they have a bad day. Uh, and you know when you, when you think of you know we know that there's lots of security issues with water treatment plants for example. There's lots of if you look at ICS cert they've they've reported that there's lots of problems with those systems being directly connected to the internet. Uh, we know those systems have security vulnerabilities. Um, people in this community have talked about it for years. Um, but, uh, th you know, the problem is that no one cares. Um, financially motivated attackers are not interested in, in attacking, um, you know, water treatment facilities. Maybe there's a, a ransomware scenario, but it would be a lot of work for them to get that software and set it up themselves and find, uh, you know, a good attack scenario that they could reproduce against people. And so they just don't bother. They've got other MOs. They've got other things that they're doing to generate money. Um, and so those things can sit out there for a long time without something bad happening to them. But a nation state has the ability to get access to that software, has the ability to find out, um, uh, or, you know, come up with an attack scenario against it may have a motivation to do so. And nation states operate on a different time scale. Um, and so um, it's not something that's going to happen next week. It's not something that's going to happen next year. Um, but it is something that may happen eventually. Um, and so, um, uh, you, you know, I think that the problem is that the longer time goes on, the, the higher the probability of these events kind of occurring. 
Um, I want to make one other observation about this, and that is that, you know, when I think of the, the cross-section and, and pressure point analysis that Dave just took us through, I really think about the, um, uh, the OPM um, breach. And uh, what I'm about to say here, you know, is a personal comment that may or may not reflect the opinions of my co-presenters. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, the... the Th th that um, you know particular data set is obviously a data set. The compromise of that data set is something that has widespread implications for the federal government in the United States. It is a it is a pressure point um, that uh, had cascading is having cascading effects, um, and we know that there are threat actors out there that have a regular attack life cycle who target identity caches. We've had multiple identity caches stolen from all kinds of different organizations by sophisticated threat actors over time. And so when you consider the sort of analysis that, that we're talking about, um, you know, the idea that that particular data set would have been targeted is a pretty predictable thing. Um, and so, um, you know, the, the question is, like, who is looking at the federal government of the United States across the board and asking, you know, what are the, what are the pressure points, what are the centers of gravity that could have widespread uh, consequences, and, and wh who's, who's responsible for prioritizing those things? Um, a lot of people are satisfied that the bureaucrat who was responsible for operating that agency uh, resigned and has been replaced with a different Washington bureaucrat, um, but I, I don't personally find that that, that, that um, it to be satisfactory. I don't think that solves the problem that we have, which is a systemic risk problem that exists at a different level of abstraction. Um, so uh, moving on from my personal editorial opinions, um, you know, what do we need to do to, to solve this problem? Um, and, you know, it's obviously a very complicated uh, problem. Um, one of the people that we spoke to who's responsible for security in a major city said, you know, I treat my city like a company. And I operate, um, you know, using the practices that I would operate if I was trying to protect a company. Um, and, uh, you know, often that, that can be effective. You, you treat each department of the city government as a, a, a business entity, a uh, business unit, and you set standards and you get everyone communicating and you, you, you come up with uh, the same sort of things that you would if you were, if you were operating in a business. Um, you, there are, however, differences, and at particular scales, um, those differences can have a bigger effect. Um, the one key difference, which Dave talked about, is the fact that you are operated by politicians who have a tendency to get reelected or not get reelected. And so, when you get a new politician, um, you know they they may have different priorities. They may have a different understanding of the significance of computer security as a priority. Uh, and so, that can cause budgets to shift. That can cause the architecture to change underneath you in a way that that is probably less predictable than you would find in a, in a company. Um, and so as we talked to uh, people that operated security in different cities, we came up with this hypothesis. And that is that there might be a sweet spot where, um, you know, if you're too small and you're too remote, chances are you have a lot of difficulty um, recruiting and training people that know things about computer security. You probably have difficulty coming up with a budget for working on computer security. Um, uh, at the same time, if you're a big city, um, you've got all these departments, you've got all these fiefdoms, you've got different people running their own IT departments with their own technologies in their own way. They don't necessarily want to cooperate with each other. And so you've got a lot of cats to herd and it can be very difficult to manage. Um, th there may be a sweet spot of, of, you know, cities that are about in the middle um, that have the resources and are big enough to attract talent infosec professionals, but at the same time, um, you know, are not, not so complicated that it's difficult to wrap your hands around. It's, it's, you know, possible to get everyone beating to the same drum. Um, and, and the implication of this hypothesis is that cities of different sizes need different things. Uh, cities that are remote, um, uh, you know, may still be targets of attacks over the internet, and they need technical help. They don't know what to do, and they don't have people who can do it. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, major cities, um, you know, may need better leadership. They need leadership that understands that this is a priority and have the political influence to get everybody um, in all these different departments working together and communicating together. Um, so one of the things that we think, um, you know, needs to be developed is a capability maturity model for cities from a security standpoint that talks about, um, you know, how well coordinated and how prepared cities are to deal with security incidents, uh, how well um, incident response teams in different uh, parts of the city communicate with each other, um, uh, you know, how, 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 how uh, you know, good that city is at just protecting and locking down the infrastructure that it has. Uh, we think there's probably a good conference talk in this capability maturity model if someone's interested in developing it. Um, 
You know, another thing that's happening out there, which we think is really interesting, is the Securing Smart Cities initiative. Um, there's a number of companies, folks here at this conference, uh, who are really interested in the risks that are posed by some of this smart cities technology that's getting deployed out there. Uh, they would like to see more work done on on, uh, on protecting that, uh, and they're trying to raise awareness. Um, there's some really good research papers up on their website, um, and uh, we definitely think it's worth checking out. Uh, um, one of the thoughts that we had as we looked at this problem, particularly the smart cities problem is that there's a need for broadband war driving. Um, we've been war driving the 802.11 spectrum for 15 years or something, um, but uh, um, you know that's just a little piece of the picture. We really need to be able to see, and in order for cities to protect themselves, they need to be able to see the entire spectrum. And when you're talking about these uh, um, these uh, you know Zigbee transmitters, they're pretty low power, and so it's very difficult to identify low power transmitters over a big physical area. Uh, so we need new strategies. Um, one strategy is is the possibility of crowdsourcing this data. I can get um, a device for 20 bucks that lets me do spectrum analysis. So um, if lots of us have them, then we can start posting things to a database somewhere. And there actually is a pretty interesting project I learned about uh, yesterday that where people are uh, beginning to do Zigbee war driving and posting it on a database online. Um, you know, another another idea, if the city wanted to take things into their own hands, that I had is is you could you could put um, spectrum analysis equipment inside of police cars because police cars drive everywhere, and so eventually you'll collect data about all of the transmitters that are, um, you know, in your municipality. Now, this idea might be a little controversial to have a, a spectrum analysis device inside of a police car that's collecting data about transmitters. Um, there could be some sensitive uh, information and unique uh, MAC addresses and things like that associated with private citizens, and perhaps that data would end up getting used for law enforcement purposes. And so um, there's probably an interesting dialogue there about, like, is that idea dangerous? Is it a good idea? What should we be doing? Um, and, uh, and so, um, I, you know, I think that this is an area where there's a need for, for new tools um, and, uh, and, and um, you know, some, some new projects. I, I think that, you know, the UI on my app um, is designed for listening to the radio. It's not really designed for spectrum analysis. I'd love to see some more um, apps that support these, uh, uh, these, uh, these, these software-defined radios that are really designed for this kind of work. So um, I think there's a lot of really cool projects and a lot of opportunities for some cool hacking to do in this, in this area. Another strategy is the use of simulation exercises. I mean, there are homeland defense type exercises that go on now, but I'm thinking about continuing that and refining that and focusing on information security in particular. Uh, and I particularly like the idea of combining it with some physical or uh, physical manifest manifestation of the of the results. So uh, when you have these uh, exercises, or it, and they can be lightweight, they can be something like a communications exercise that just tells people who to call in certain circumstances, and they practice those all the way down to to very deep dive uh, exercises, perhaps from the packet level up. Uh, I, I like the idea of a, a physical manifestation. You may be familiar with uh, uh, SANS' Cyber City project that uh, that has underlying critical infrastructure and allows uh, people to do exercises on the on the underlying critical infrastructure sector but you get real world responses uh, from the the miniaturized city I can envision a day you know where a city could have like a, a small version of itself that they would use to to conduct these exercises uh, another would be the efforts out at the Michigan cyber range and and then the, if there's an opportunity to come up with a virtualized solution uh, that would allow people to to do uh, uh, this uh, this ty these type of exercises in a very scalable uh, scalable way, uh, and given the political really the the political motivations required to affect change, uh, the, the work of the information security community to raise public awareness and and gain media attention that gets then voters concerned uh, is I, I think a necessary aspect of of helping secure cities. Uh, would also point to Estonia. When you think about Estonia, Estonia is smaller, the Estonia the nation is smaller than many uh, United States cities. But it takes it, you know, they've learned their lessons uh, from uh, their, um, really the, the major attack that they suffered. So they've got, uh, they're, they're building in uh, information security into the backbone of what they do. Right, it's not an afterthought. And there's a nice article on their model for e-government uh, in the Communications of the ACM June 2015 edition. So if it's something uh, that you're interested in, and that I'd, I'd recommend that to you. We had to put that in there, okay. And uh, with that, I think uh, any parting comments? Yeah, let's, no. Okay, we'll take, uh, take some questions, thanks. Microphone. 
the microphones. I don't know. Um, someone's got their hand raised. It's really hard for us yeah. to see you, so just go ahead. So what we've done is uh, we, we, we're really not at liberty to discuss this, the specific cities. It's kind of a standard practice, right? But we've, we've worked with several large cities and have been um, helping them design. So basically talked about with their problems, helping them design the exercises, kind of a top-down approach. And then, Tom, uh, and then Tom's taken a, uh, a bottom-up approach uh, to, to gather information. But do you want to go? Yeah, I mean, well, so, uh, I, I think that... that um um, let, let's put it this way. Different cities are at different levels of sophistication with respect to this. So we did a couple of the cities that we were talking to were trying to look at like doing across the board pen testing um, uh, or they had just begun to do so. Um, and so like really what we're trying to do is provide a framework for people to organize that work and to think about what they need to do. So I, I guess I might be the next to ask a question. Um, just kind of a brief one and I... I don't want this to come across the wrong way, but with the idea of, you know, out of uh, EMS, um, telecom, trash collection, especially trash collection because they drive everywhere, out of all the different entities within a city that drive all over the place, you selected police. Man, what's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> we did have this internal discussion. Tom, would you like to field, field that question? <laughs> uh, you know, I don't know. It, it's what occurred to me. I, I like garbage trucks. Garbage trucks is a good that, one. Go that's what came to my yeah. mind, too. I, garbage trucks are not always municipal. Some people have private garbage collection. That's a good point. Something I don't know. Left whatever. Left. Yeah, I, I think that there are interesting controversial questions that, that that raises. And I, I think it's an interesting discussion, which uh, I'd be happy to have over beer uh, once, this is, uh, once this is over. Right. <laughs> if you're buying. <laughs> With regard to... Um, crowdsourcing, the uh, spectrum uh, analysis, the, the war driving. Um, what's your experience and expectation of the municipal response to that? In some jurisdictions, it's illegal. <laughs> right. I mean, so it goes back to the comment that I made that, that um, you, you know, this, we see cities that are all over the board from a sophistication standpoint. Perhaps that was clear in the, in the diagram of, of TCP IP services I put up there. And, and uh, we see uh, cities that, that, like within a city, you have different organizations that are all over the board from a sophistication standpoint. And so certainly one of the, the uh, stages of coming to terms with information security is the stage where you start shooting the messenger. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, absolutely, like, like going around doing wireless uh, uh, war driving is going to provoke uh, some people, but um, I, I guess taking them through the process of being provoked and reaching acceptance that, that this is a reality is part of how we get people to do the right things, maybe. So, um, you know, perhaps it's a good thing that we provoke them sometimes. Have you been doing anything with foreign cities? Uh, Shell has this global initiative on smart cities. Singapore is looking on smart governance. Tokyo is getting really worried about the Olympics in 2020. Yep. There should be a really big market out there for this. Yeah, so we did talk to uh, um, some, some overseas journalists yesterday about some of this. And, and um, it, it does seem that, that uh, internationally there are some countries that just sort of feel like this isn't a, as big a problem as it is in the United States. You know, they feel like their government uh, uh, entities and infrastructure sectors cooperate better than maybe we do. Uh, um, I don't know to, uh, to the extent to which that is true. It may, may be the case, may not be. But I agree. I think, I think you know, cities that have uh, um, upcoming uh, huge events like Olympics or World Cup or, uh, um, you know, et cetera, um, this is this this I think is a is a good way to sort of analyze um, one aspect of the security for those large scale events. Yeah. So uh, to add to what you're saying, I, I definitely think that the Japanese uh, government is taking information security around the Olympics very seriously. Um, uh, it, it seems to be that there are a bunch of initiatives that they've launched uh, around that and around incident response and the like. Um, uh, and also, you know, for, to further your point, um, the smart cities initiatives um, are really seem to be taking off in Europe where people seem to be a little bit more concerned with energy conservation than they are in the United States. Um, and so, um, you know, a lot of that infrastructure is getting deployed over there and a lot of the vulnerabilities are, are, are propping up over there. So um, you're probably going to see some of those things unfold there before you see them unfold here. So just one other thing uh, in terms of the 
uh, pushback in terms of monitoring. Why is the spectrum monitoring more, say, um, of a touch point than Google driving around doing its mapping? Well, I mean, it's the same thing, right? Because they were war driving as, as they mapped and they got in trouble because the, I guess they were collecting clear text uh, um, uh, Wi-Fi packets. And so ar- arguably they were wiretapping, um, you know, and so uh, um, uh, clearly, like, if you're going to do that, then you need you need to avoid collecting content. Um, but, you know, knowing that the transmitter is there and knowing what kind of transmitter it is, um, you know, is not content information. But these are the kinds of things that need to be sussed out in order to run an operation like this. And obviously, Google is a very savvy company when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, technology. And uh, they ran afoul of this. So it's obviously um, a, to a minefield to a certain extent. Um, and people need to understand the issues when they proceed with it. It's, and that's basically the reason that I'm saying it needs to be a discussion. So uh, I'd also add the, the idea of a business opportunity. It, that, I mean, I do sense that there's there's a market if you if for organizations or penetration testers to think the next level of scale. Now I don't know how much budget, how much money cities have to actually hire penetration testing firms, but I think cities are increasingly becoming interested. So it looks like we're out of time, and uh, there uh, I see a black uh, black and white zero being held up at us. <laughs> so we'll we'll go ahead and uh, end here, and uh, we're happy to. You know, Thank you very much for coming to our Thank talk. Thank you very awesome. much. Thanks.